after we are shaved, we are ordered to grab a dress from a pile on the cement floor and given wooden clogs. The clogs seem to be all the same size, but don't really fit anymore. They are hard and difficult to walk in. I have to shuffle to get anywhere. My my dress hangs down to the ground like a sack. Since my head is freezing, I tear off a piece of fabric from the bottom of my dress to wrap around my head. At least my head is covered, but I am still very cold. I don't understand why I can't retrieve my old socks and undergarments that are in a heap on the floor close by. As soon as we are dressed, we are forced to go outside and line up for Zellapel. Zellapel. Zellapel, which is a roll call. Right. It is now late in the evening and there are so many people moving about that I get separated from my sisters. I am frightened and frantically call out their names. Two bald women in dingy dresses approach me. They reach for me and reassure me, Rosie, it's us. I hug them both fiercely and stammer, I did not recognize you. I'm so relieved to be with them that I can't stop shaking. So, I mean, any illusion that things were going to work out in any way that could be remotely considered humane must are completely shattered at this point. Completely shattered. I mean, you know, when you're being told, hey, pack a bag, hey, get on the train, like those things don't sound good, but they at least sound they at least sound somewhat reasonable. They sound like a reasonable, okay, we got our bag, we're going to be taken somewhere. All that is completely gone now. Absolutely, absolutely. And you're 14 years old. Right. How tall are you? Uh, five one. So you're this little girl. Just followed rules. Whatever they were saying, we had to just follow. Things happened so fast. You cannot imagine. We didn't even have time to think about anything. Go here, go there, do this, do that, and that's it. You know, it's it's uh, one of the things that they do in the military, right? Is they take you, they take everything that you have, they shave your head, and they're they're trying to get rid of your individuality, right? They want to they want to remove some of that. And this is just the exact you know what they're did there, but they're doing it to a to an absolute extreme. You know, stripping you naked and shaving your entire body and just removing anything that you had from the past. Well, I don't think you can compare that to the military. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to compare it to the military. I'm. I guess I'm just trying to say that the idea Certain of rules. I guess. Well, the idea of when they shave your head in the military, part of what they're doing is trying to take away some of your individuality, right? So that you can become part of the group. Here, they're trying to take away your humanity. That's it. That's what they did. Going on here, it says, All of us notice a huge fire spewing heavy smoke that looks like a burning mountain across the open area from us. I can see shadows of people moving through the smoke and can hear the cries of children. There is an overpowering foul smell coming from the fire. Somehow I taste the fire in my mouth. Yutki asks the guard as she gestures toward the fire, what is all that noise about? The guard responds, they are burning hair. Yutki replies, burning hair would not make such a noise. To which he snaps, they are burning cripples. A sick feeling comes over me as I realize the guards and soldiers are barbaric, cold-blooded animals. Yeah. So that's your first recognition that we are going to receive zero right. humanity from these guards. Absolutely. You can't even explain how things were. They were so horrible, so unbelievable. And this all went on for so long, and nobody tried to help us. Because this is 1944. Right. So this had been going on. This was five months before our part of the world was liberated. Do you know that? Mm-hmm. By September 1944, our part was liberated by the Russians. Going back to the book, Barrack 26 is our sleeping quarters. 
I have never seen anything like it before. Dirt floors and rows of wooden three-tiered bunks. No straw-filled mattresses. No blankets or pillows. No heat. A fireplace that doesn't work. Hayusera, Yutki, and I are assigned to the top bunk with five other women. We climb up and huddle body to body to stay warm during the freezing cold night. I am so thankful that my sisters are with me because everything is foreign, harsh, unexplained, and unbearably cold. The next morning, I decide to look around the camp to figure out where we are. I assure my sisters there are a lot of people milling around and I can blend in or hide. I will be careful. I walk outside and am shocked to see many barracks just like the one we slept in, arranged in rows of buildings. There are dozens of people walking around outdoors, all shaved, all shivering. Some are wandering around like zombies. When I try to talk to one of these zombie-like women, she just stares through me, doesn't answer, and keeps walking. She is truly frightening to me. It is as though she is here, but not really here at all. There is a 12-foot electric fence encircling the camp. Dead people hang from the fence, their bodies contorted. I wonder why so many would grab onto the electric fence to end their life. What kind of hell are we in? Why are we prisoners? Feeling like a second-class citizen at home was nothing compared to this. I am on a mission to learn all I can, so I ask those who have been here longer to help me understand. Most of the women are very patient with me, asking questions because they remember how frightening and foreign everything was for them when they arrived. They explain that some people cannot endure the severity of the camp and know that if they hold on to the electrified fence, their life ends in 20 seconds. One thing I learned for certain is no one can escape. There are guards with guns, the deadly electric fence, and people watching your every move. This must be hell. Unbelievable. Unexplainable. The half-dead, zombie-like people and the bodies clinging to the electric fence are overpowering. I am in a daze seeing the true horrors of war here. As I walk around, I think I hear my Yiddish name called out softly. How could anyone in this godforsaken place know my Yiddish name? But then I hear it again. Rosie. I turn to see a man in a striped uniform who I did not recognize, but who is beckoning to me. He approaches me and says, Don't you know who I am? I'm your Tata. With a wave of pure shock, I realize it is Tata. I'm tremendously relieved. At home, Tata always wore a suit and a hat and glasses and had a beard. I look again at this man with no hair and I know it's him. I hug him as tight as I can, cry and kiss him and kiss him some more. His arms around me are the first sense of warmth I've felt since arriving. Tata explains that he and Fischl were selected to go work in a factory. They will leave soon, but in the meantime, he has been looking everywhere for his family. He decided we must be in this all-women's camp where the Hungarian people are sent. Where is your mother, he asks. I don't know, but I have Yutkin Hayusara with me. Whatever you do, stay together, because you will have a much better chance of survival, Tata replies. I think what chance does a 14-year-old have of surviving in a place like this? But I don't say anything. Tata holds both of my arms at my side, looks me in the eyes, and sternly says, make sure you stay alive so you can tell the world what they are doing to us. I assure him I will do my best. Then he and I make plans for us to meet again tomorrow at this spot. That's a heavy charge from your dad. Oh my God, yeah. Unbelievable. You know, every time I open the book and I go through it a little bit, I, I just can't believe that this happened to us, that the world allowed this. And the world knew what was going on. But nobody tried to help us. Just because we were Jewish. <clears throat> Continue on. The next day, Yutki Hayasara 
and I wait at the designated spot to meet up with Tata and Fischl. When we see them, I cry in relief. We all hug and kiss each other, and we are so happy to have time together. Tata repeats his solemn advice to each of us. Do your best to stay together. Stay alive so you can tell the world what they are doing to us. The next day, we go to our spot to meet Tata and Fischl. As planned, we wait and wait and wait for what seems to like an eternity, but they do not come. Fast forward a little bit. Hayusara, Yutki, and I have no choice but to stay together in this evil place. We share a bunk bed, meals, and one bathroom with a thousand women. No one is allowed to use the bathroom at night. It has sinks with cold running water, but no soap for us to wash up. There's no toilet, just a hole in the ground. There is nowhere to shower or take baths. We only have one plain dress we are wearing and no way to clean it except with the cold water. Without a shower or soap, we are constantly filthy. We are always itchy with the bites of lice and bed bugs. We can rinse out our dress and walk around naked while it dries. It doesn't really matter because we are surrounded by 28,000 women in the same predicament. We have no way really to clean our dress or our clogs. We are left to rot for months in the same horrible dress. I realize quickly this concentration camp has some predictable events. Every day as they count us, Every day they count us as we stand in rows of five people. At 5 a.m. the guard shouts, get up, get up, schnell, schnell, quick, quick. We all rise and run outdoors to be counted whether it is freezing, rainy, or sunny. We stand in lines for hours, three times a day until the guards have a tally. Then we are released back to our barracks. I'm told this is how they know how much space is available for the new people they bring in by train every day. People leave to go to work in factories, get killed, or are gassed, so the counting is necessary. Sometimes we are forced to kneel and hold up rocks until our arms feel like they will break and the rocks fall. Other times they make us move rocks from one spot to another, then back to the original location. It doesn't make any sense, but we don't ask questions. We keep our heads down and do what we are told because any resistance may mean we will be shot. I have seen it happen. I cannot escape the horrible smell of the crematorium's chimney of the burning bodies 24 hours a day. The sickening stench of burning flesh makes me want to vomit and never becomes less upsetting emotionally. The smoke and smell burn a black hole in my heart. We have to find a way out of this place, and that will require me knowing as much as possible about how it is run. Women explain that prisoners are chosen for jobs and they must comply. Any Jewish worker who resists is shot dead on the spot. Strong Jewish women called capos are put in charge of running each barrack. The capos live amongst us in the barrack and watch everything. They are not paid, but they have certain rights that others lack. They may get more food, but they are doing the dirty work for the Germans. The cooks preparing the meals are Jewish as well. Jews clean out the bathroom in the barracks that is used by 28,000 women. Jews even work the gas chamber. Everything was done by the Jews. If you didn't do it, they would shoot you on the spot. You had no choice. They would see their own families go into the gas chamber, and there was not anything they could do or say. You say here, this is too much for me to process, and I begin to see why some people touch the electric fence to end their misery. I ask repeatedly why we can hear people crying out near the crematorium. I learn that when a group is gassed in the showers, not all the people are dead when they burn the bodies. Maybe they don't give them enough gas because we can hear the screaming coming from the crematorium. The men running the incinerators called Sonder Commandos, will be sent into them soon so they cannot tell the world what is happening. So you even have the, the Jews are running the... The factories, they're running the gas chambers, they're running everything. And eventually they're going in them too. Absolutely, yes. 
Usually the gas chambers, uh, I've heard from many people say that after three months they would change the guards at the gas chambers and they would... Every-